Hi everyone, this is Matt Touchot with Intro Stats. Uh, today we're continuing our discussion about the basics of hypothesis testing. We've kind of been going through uh, the hypothesis test a little bit. We talked about null and alternative hypothesis, test statistics. We talked about the idea of p-value. So now we're kind of getting to this point uh, where we're going to uh, start to see if we can write a conclusion, a final conclusion for the hypothesis test. So today is all about writing conclusions. So let's get started. All right. So um, the one thing about a conclusion is um, saying that you reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis is not actually a conclusion. A conclusion has to address the claim. It has to address what the person uh, in the article said or what the person asked you to figure out. And you have to talk about whether or not you have some evidence towards what you're saying. So it's all about claim and evidence. So it's really a statement about claim and evidence. Now to kind of get the idea of what's possible in a conclusion, let's kind of go back a little bit to what we learned about p-value. So in our last videos, we've been kind of going through p-value. And we found that if the p-value was less than or equal to the significance level, Right? That means it's unlikely to be sampling variability. It means that we have, also means that we have evidence, right? That low p-value is considered evidence if it came from unbiased sample data. So, um, so again, what we said was if the p-value was less than or equal to the significance level, it's unlikely to be sampling variability. That means we're allowed to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? Reject the null hypothesis. And that low p-value from unbiased sample data would be considered some evidence towards that. So rejecting the null hypothesis. But again, well, that's great. If the, if the null hypothesis was the claim, we would just say that we're going to reject the claim. But what if the claim was actually HA? What if the claim was the alternative, the opposite? Well, then what you're allowed to do now is, since you're saying you, you have evidence that the null is probably wrong, so that's kind of giving us evidence that HA might be correct, right, or supporting HA. So a low p-value tells you again that you're rejecting the null hypothesis and you're sort of supporting the alternative. The alternative might be correct and we think the null is probably wrong, okay? Now, the high p-value, right, we were talking about this in our previous videos about the high p-value, right? So if a p-value is more than the significance level, more than our alpha or significance level, then we're going to, what we say, fail to reject the null hypothesis, right? So we kind of talked about this, how when you have a high p-value, you have a little bit of issue now that, because it could just be sampling variability. In other words, the null might be correct, and maybe your sample data disagrees just because of sampling variability, or maybe the null is wrong. It's really, it's almost like you can't tell anymore if the null is right or wrong. Um, so the, a high p-value tells us that we basically will fail to reject the null hypothesis. That means you do not have evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, that's the way you want to think about it. You don't have evidence to reject it. Now, that doesn't prove that, it's, that the null hypothesis is correct. Though it does lean in that direction, a high p-value kind of leans in the null might be, but um, there's really no evidence for that. Well, it, you have to be able to reject the null hypothesis to be able to support the alternative hypothesis. So if you don't know if the null hypothesis is wrong, you also don't really know that the alternative is correct or not. So again, what we would say for a high p-value would be that there's not evidence really to support the alternative hypothesis. Does that sort of make sense? So, um, so again, a high p-value, we're going to fail to reject the null. It's like not evidence to reject the null hypothesis. That's also not evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. So that what you see here is you really have sort of four options when you write a conclusion. So it's either a high or a low p-value, and then your claim, what the person actually said in the article, could be the null or the alternative. So you have to kind of um, take that into account. Now, I will say most of the time, claims are usually the alternative hypothesis. So uh, you'll use uh, support 
uh, more often than you will reject. But um, let's take a look at it. So I've got this little chart here that kind of summarizes it. I hope it's helpful for you. So if you notice, so sort of we had maybe what did the person say is called the claim, right? The population claim. What did the person say or think is true about the population? So if the claim was the null hypothesis, that means the claim had some kind of equal to or not related or no effect in the null hypothesis. Um, and then your but also the claim might be the alternative. Maybe the person said something, a statement that does not have an equal to part or involves change or effect or, or relationship. So the claim, the, what the person said, could be either one of these. And you have to sort of take that into account when you write your conclusion. Now, we also have the p-value, right? We could have a p-value that's lower than the significance level, a low p-value, and we could have a p-value that's high, higher than the significance level. Now, if the data came, was unbiased and you know, met all the assumptions for the test, then a low p-value from some unbiased sample data would be considered some evidence, and you have some evidence for what you're saying. If it's a high p-value, then usually that's considered, again, not evidence. You do not have significant evidence. It could just be sampling variability. Now, remember, all of this works on how, how unbiased is your sample data. How, and that's why we spent a lot of time in the class talking about biases. But if your data is sort of representative of the population, then a low p-value would be considered evidence. Now, Think about it this way, what happens if I have some bad data? What if I'm using some bad sample data that does not meet the assumptions? Well, then this kind of goes up. This kind of, this kind of doesn't work anymore. A low p-value from bad data is, would not be considered evidence anymore because, again, that p-value is based on data that does not represent the population. So all of this works on how well your data is, how, how good is your data. All right, so let's assume that we got some really good data that mess, met all the assumptions. What, what, what could we say? Well, if the claim was the, if they, we had a low p-value, then we would be rejecting the null hypothesis, right? But the null hypothesis is the, if the, if the null hypothesis was the claim, then wouldn't we be rejecting the claim? Right, that's exactly right. We would be rejecting the claim, right? So I would say something like this. There is significant evidence to reject the claim. In other words, I think the claim is wrong, and I have some evidence to back that up. Now, what happens if we have a high p-value? Well, remember, a high p-value means it could be sampling variability, and it's not considered evidence, and, and, so, and we fail to reject the null. Right? If you guys remember, that's your rule. Remember, the p-value really only tells you something about the null. Uh, you have to sort of make an inference to, to, make, to say something about the alternative. But the rule for high p-value is we fail to reject the null. In other words, I don't have evidence to reject the null. But if the null was the claim, then you don't have evidence to reject the claim. Does that make sense? In the conclusion, you, have to, you can't just say null and alternative. You have to say claim. You have to kind of think about what the person actually said or what the person asked you to figure out as the statistician or the data scientist. So if we kind of look at that, right? So if, the, if it was a high p-value and the claim was the null hypothesis, I would say there's not significant evidence to reject the claim. Okay, that means the claim could be correct, but I don't really have evidence to, um, evidence, uh, to prove one way or the other. Okay? Now, what happens if the claim is HA? Okay, so again, we got a low p-value, right? If we had a low p-value from some unbiased sample data, that would consider it significant evidence, and it means that we can reject the null hypothesis, right? We think the null hypothesis might be wrong. But if the, if the null is wrong, then the HA might be correct, right? So we might be supporting HA. So a low p-value tells you, again, that you can reject the null, but you're also supporting HA. So if HA was the claim, if the person in the article said uh, uh, a statement that was the alternative hypothesis, then we can support that claim. This is also kind of what everybody in a hypothesis test is looking for. They like this one a lot. 
They want to make the claim HA, and they're hoping they're going to get a low p-value from some good data. And that's going to give them significant evidence to support the claim. So that's the only time you really can support the claim and you have evidence to back it up. So again, a claim HA, HA and a low p-value would tell me there is significant evidence to support the claim. I think the claim is correct, what that person said in the article, and I have evidence to back it up. Okay? All right, what about this one? So what if I have a high p-value and the claim is HA? Okay, this is the tricky one, right? So a high p-value means it could be sampling variability, so we're not really sure um, if the null is wrong, if the null might be correct, um, and then it's not evidence either. So, so if, I, if I don't know that the null is right or wrong, I sort of don't know if HA is right or wrong. So, um, so a high p-value and the claim is HA, we would say there's not significant evidence to support the claim. It's kind of a not support situ uh, situation. So in other words, the claim might be wrong, but I really don't have evidence to back it up. So it's a not support situation. Right? The claim might be wrong, but I don't have evidence. Okay, that's kind of the idea. So these are sort of the four conclusions you can write. Okay? Depending on what your situation you're dealing with. Alright. So um, let's look at a couple examples here. So Here's our first example. We're looking at the population mean body temperature. Uh, this was um, uh, sample data that I got off of StatKey. Uh, if you remember, we kind of have used this example in the past. Um, and uh, again, my null hypothesis was that the population mean body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The alternative hypothesis was that the population mean mu is less than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's what many scientists believe, that pop, the population mean body temperature is actually less than 98.6. Um, when I was growing up, they always said it was 98.6, but nowadays we kind of think it's lower. So that's my claim. That's what we think is true. We actually don't think it's still 98.6. We think it's less than 98.6. So that's my claim. It's important to know when you're writing a conclusion is what's the claim. Was the claim the null or was the claim HA? That's really important. Now, I got my p-value and my significance.